Ted Griffin that wrote Ocean's Eleven told me that he only did one movie, wrote one movie, and he's written Matchstick Men and many other films where he didn't know the end of the second act. So I knew I had to have the end of the second act, a point where uh, it, what this man's goal was that he could convince his wife he could break up with her and, and make it seem like she, that she'd go along with it, that it would be okay. I can convince this woman that breaking up is a good thing uh, and, and get out of here and get on with my life. Of course, being the antagonist, he ends up on the bottom end of that, and the protagonist being women, since my theme of, in Lipstick Jungle and 30-something and so many projects is women are equal to men, uh, and letting playing the dumb guy is really fun um, <laughs> in movies. So that's what, that, that, I was able to give a three-act structure not only to myself, but to each character, because there were so few. Uh, uh, the wife wanted to have a perfect day. She was with her family. She wanted to have a great day at the beach. She wanted a happy day, and she got really far from it, and then she ends up where she wanted to be. The daughter wants to avoid dealing with her family. She ends up getting right in the middle of it, solving their problems, and getting in the middle of it, and then ends up uh, 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 sort of saving the day, but on the upside of it. She, she bonds with these other women. And the other girl comes to the beach to have a great time, gets really far from it, and then ends up having a good time. It's simple, simple structure. It goes all the way back to the Greeks. But you've got to pay attention to it when you lay out a story. And knowing the end of the second act is really important, which I learned from Picking Brains, so I had that going into it. Uh, the money we had went into cards and props. Um, uh, and uh, uh, a lunch I, uh, I got from the uh, Mexican restaurant. Uh, and that was it. Now there's been festivals, and the editor, I got an assistant editor on the show and she was able to make it, and she did a phenomenal job uh, with the piece. And we were able to just tell a little story, it runs about the length of most albums that we had when we had long play albums, 44 minutes, and it's a simple story, garage band style, by a bunch of uh, uh, actors and and photographers and, and sound guy, uh, and we went and jammed. And the one smart fellow part of it came up on the day um, that I need, the girls had been doing it on the set, the one smart fellow, and I knew we needed a moment where I was contemplating telling her I wanted to leave, and I said, do that thing you did on the set, and they did it there, and then went, oh, let's put it in the bedroom with Laura, and then let's bring it back at the end. So even on the day, uh, one smart fellow just happened on the day. A lucky accident, like so many great songs. And lastly, the inspiration of, um, of, of uh, Martin Scorsese's documentary on George Harrison. And in that documentary, there's a scene where Bob Dylan is in a makeshift booth, and he's singing and working on a song, and outside the booth, Tom Petty, Roy Orbison, and George Harrison are out there talking amongst each other and then talking to Dylan about how to make the song work. And that team effort, that garage band effort, is the core of all good theater. You need that. And team sport. I couldn't have made it without everybody, so everybody got even credit. We all own 7.69% of this movie. Nobody is in it that I didn't meet. Nobody worked on it. There's not one producer credit up there for somebody we didn't need. Uh, we didn't have to say, oh, okay, how much money do we need? It feels like X amount of dollars. Start at zero and then work your way up from there. And you can make a lot more movies. Anyway, that's the story behind the making of that. Um, and, you know, we are uh, uh, very fortunate. Uh, uh, to have this recognition, but the great part of it has come with the festivals that hopefully we can help share that with young filmmakers and erase the mystery of, of how difficult movies are to make. We spend too much money and too much time making movies that don't work by having too many cooks in the kitchen rather than just jamming like a garage band and jam with pros, jam with non-pros, just play. And that's how you get better. You don't get better by all your world into one movie that you're going to make in your life and put everything into it and then do it and move on. I'd forgotten 
that we shot this until the editor sent me the cut. I was off doing something else. And we were like, oh, oh, Alyssa sent us once more a fellow. Let's watch it. And Melissa and I were like, uh, we'd totally forgotten. <laughs> That's the way it usually is. And with the movie stars, that's absolutely the way it is because they're three movies down the line. Brad Pitt's three movies and five in development when one of his movies comes out. He's like, oh, I forgot I shot that a year ago. Uh, okay, what do we need to do? And that's where you want to be uh, by the time it finally gets where it's imprinted, where it can go out to people. You want to have moved on. Anyway, uh, please, questions, anybody? Yes, sir. I just want to say thank you for the way you related this to jamming like musicians and like, you know, it's like improv. Um, people that go up there and do improv, they just, they go up and play and there's no pressure on them to put the camera in front of them and that allows them to just go there and play and, and do it and the fact that you're able to do that in one day makes it so, I mean, you guys are obviously great actors at the top of your game, so you're able to play at the highest level and that shows, but. You know, it's funny, all the actors, except for the kid was working more than the rest of us as actors, honestly. Uh, I was producing, Melissa was acting on the show, Laura Ennis was directing on the show, uh, and the kid, but, you know, thank you, that, that, that is, is, that's the way to do it. And nowadays, it's the way to do it. Tell your, if you know people want to make movies, hop in the backseat of a car, with, have your buddies with two cameras, cross shoot, right, with French overs, which is what we call shots from behind, Branch overs and shoot that way and, and give them a little structure. You want to go to the movie. She doesn't want to go see that movie. She wants to see the other movie. Get really far from what you want. Then convince her boy meets girl, boy gets girl, boy loses girl. End of the second act. Boy gets girl. Train wreck. Silly little movie. Perfect three act structure. All of Judd Apatow's movies. Perfect three act structure. And then they just go crazy inside that. Sir. Yeah, in reference to your uh, um, garage band uh, analogy, uh, would you say you, as a filmmaker that you get into a, a groove uh, on the set with your fellow actors and, and movie makers? Is it like a, a band in the sense that you have a groove that you fall into? So on? much so, yeah, totally. We knew we had the two, the two centerpieces were the, the, the argument out on the, on the deck with Melissa and the argument on the inside. Those were going to, two, two, and, you know, when you're running on cards, you shoot, we, we shot 15-minute takes. And then we'd stop and say, what did we leave out? Let's go back and grab that. Camera guys would move around, maybe find a couple other spots. We didn't tell them where to go. I never told. The, that's why I gave the camera operator, assistant director, the co-director spot. He found, and he would sometimes throw out, you know, go back and get this. We were dancing with the cameras improvisationally. They were dancing with each other. I had no idea, nor did Melissa, that Laura Ennis was going to walk out onto the deck and not see her. We didn't know, so we just go with it. We jammed with her. We went. She went outside, and the camera guys went, oh, she's going outside. Okay, get away and click, click, light, you know, DP, wait, and now let's go from there. But totally in a, in a, in a, exactly what that is. That's what you want. That's what we miss. Mm. in network television. Mm. Network television is so many cooks in the kitchen and there is so many shows on the network level especially are written out of fear that the network isn't going to like this and the people won't like that and then the actors won't say it the way I want to say it. Attachment isn't only a problem in the personal world, it's a real big problem in, in music and in, and in good improvisational theater. You can't be attached to what you wrote. You have to give the actors an opportunity to make it something better. And you don't see that anywhere in television. The actors are petrified to stray from the words for one word. Now, maybe not on, on um, Transparent, maybe not on Girls, maybe not on anything that Judd Apatow is doing. Those guys, they, they have a freedom about them, but that's why they're the successes that are out there. But for the most part, we all come from TV where we can't fix anything because we can't say to the actors now, just let it rip. I don't care what you say. You know, let it play and get, because that being together is going to lure the audience in. They're going to believe it more. They're, they're, they're not going to listen to the words. You're not supposed to be listening to the words. The words are the tip of the iceberg. You're supposed to be watching the behavior that's forcing the words. Yes? Joe, um, I really 
appreciate the fact um, that you, um, what you said just now, and also in your film, um, it shows that you know how to blend intuition with something you've learned at school or you know in drama, etc. That to me stands out as extremely important. Like real mastery is when you can blend all of these things. It's not just about the idea. It's also about what you learn. And you have to learn it in a certain way. And um, so and contrary to the guy in the, in the last film, <laughs> your ego is <laughs> under control. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that sounds really funny. Oh. And, yeah. and can you um, enlighten us with mastery, how, how you blend those things? How you, because I, I feel it's an important message for anyone who would like to uh, make films and make good films. Well, I think first of all, we're stu we have to be students. I've been very fortunate, and, I've, and maybe it was an athletic upbringing where athletes, at, there's technically one really right way to throw a baseball. There's technically one way to swing the bat. There's one way to do a lot of things in, in sports. Practice, practice, practice at those fundamentals allow you to, to execute and then go to another level. And I learned, as I learned in sports, I learned and I picked the brains of really good people in a really obnoxious way. And I'm, uh, I have alienated a lot of people <laughs> by going, oh, here he comes again. Uh, and he's going to ask me how I did this and how I did that. And I am a student of it. And I think understanding and the confidence of knowledge, allowing instincts to take, trusting in instincts, that it has to be experienced. I think true knowledge has to be experienced. You can't just read it in a book. You have to do it. And in 1986, when Trapper John M.D. ended and I would become the lead on the show, I moved to Sacramento and I started a professional theater touring the schools doing plays for kids, adult actors doing plays for kids. And the audience is the most difficult audience there is. And we had, they just, if they don't like it, they'll just get up and go or start talking to someone or go to the bathroom or do whatever. And to hold that audience and then to hold that audience with structure, that experience over and over again is so important. We've got to know in here, we all knew where we were going. We all knew in the outline exactly what we wanted and we knew where we were going. Everybody knew that had, had a script. Everybody had 26 uh, one or two sentence scenes of what went on in that scene. So we all knew where we were going, but we tended to the three act structure. I was able to be patient early on, which we never are in television, through experience. The frustration of doing TV and on page one, people are talking. Well, it's a black Maxima that was rolling down Highway 25 when it blew out a tire and the woman in the green car went by and you're like, oh my God. There's no chance for the audience to actually lean in. There's no, and with kids, all you want is them to lean in. And you really have to pay attention to and trust that the audience is gonna be following the story and that you can take your time. You don't have to be clear about what's going on early on. That's, that's repetition. So for instincts to be able to play here, you have to trust in the structure. If you're structureless, then you'll sort of feel like, I don't know where we're going with this. I don't know where we're going. If you know you're headed for a breakup, well then the actress playing my wife, who is my wife, um, she knows, and she knows she's the uh, uh, protagonist, so she's gonna not see it coming. She knows it's her job to act like she doesn't have any clue what's going to happen. Her instincts take her there. So experience. Hundreds of episodes with Michael Landon uh, on Little House on the Prairie. 50 TV movies that were overwritten and terrible. Uh, <laughs> have taught her structure. So we all knew how to fill the structure. I don't think I answered your question at all. Uh, I'll come back to it, maybe. <laughs> yes, sir. First of all, I'm a big fan. Thanks. Um, and you're you're so 100% speaking my language. I'm a relatively new like producer. I've done four shorts. Relatively, yeah. Go ahead. There's a microphone here. I've done four shorts and uh, a pilot episode, and I'm doing my first feature this year, right? So, 
And this is what, what you described is exactly what I learned, where the production spirals out of control like this. First you need the lights, so then you need more crew, and then you need to pay them, and then you need more shooting days. And it just spirals up and up and up and up, and it just becomes this insurmountable production. And what I really want to do is exactly what you just described. And shooting a 44-minute film in one day is just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable and unheard of to shoot that many minutes of a film in one day. Most people are shooting four minutes of a film in one day. Uh, that's just how it goes. You know, I try to shoot nine minutes of a film in one day. Right. Um, so it's about we shoot in TV. We try to shoot ten minutes a day or, or a little bit less, yeah. But my question, all right, is shorts don't make money. You know, they don't. Uh, and the way the feature film business is out of my reach and out of my uh -huh. control. But where does this ethos that you are talking about that I love, where does the rubber hit the road in terms of the connection to the to the business side of the industry. great great question um we uh, uh on monday our editor will be working dot studio pro uh is a site that you are able to control and launch yourself they're going to want 50 cents so if you put it on up for 2.99 uh you can be your own salesperson we're going to be able to sell it ourselves. We're going to be able to. Now, my wife has got like 100,000 Facebook friends, a lot of people in it. We'll go that way first. They'll link to the site. They'll be able to buy it. We'll be able to monitor around the world where it's coming from, and we'll be able to promote it. And with a cost, which is now the festivals at about a couple grand, uh, we're only going to need to sell about 700 views worldwide to be able to get our money back. So. Um, there is a world that is away from network TV that is now apps and phones will be able to, everybody will be able to get to anything from their phone. Phones will operate the TVs. So people are going to be able to say, oh, here's a, and kids, if you haven't noticed, they're buying nonstop. And if you haven't, if you have kids, you haven't looked at your bill, uh, you, you'll see that they are constantly shopping online for content. Click, boom, buy it, watch it, next one. That's what they do. So that is going to manifest itself like the shorts in the 20s when silent films started. They didn't start with gigantic movies. They started with shorts. Those sold commercially. People went and paid for those. Likewise, now you're going to see people being able to link to Dot Studio Pro, or you can actually, for $1,400, put your movie up on Amazon, Google, and uh, uh, iTunes. Uh, for about 1400 bucks, you're in those three stores. Hmm. And those are some worldwide. So the cost of a movie, business-wise, is going to depend on what you need. Uh, if it's Ben-Hur, you're going to need a lot of people. Uh, if what you can tell or what you want to tell is a story, a smaller story about um, somebody doing something really stupid and losing some really good, something that's really what they should hang on to, and how stupid men can be, um, you start with that before you start with any money. Um, cameras are nothing. You can, everybody has one. And you can get, can, people got 5Ds. It's not the camera, it's the glass. It's not the camera, it's the glass, it's the lens. It's the glass that's in the lens that gives quality. It, it, the cameras, most of them are pretty basic and they're all the same, plastic and some mirrors and some other stuff. Some are higher abilities and lower abilities, but for the most part, some decent lenses. And if you can handle a handheld, then you don't need dollies. If you can have a monopod, you can be a little still. We did some sticks, mostly handheld. I wanted that real feel. I wanted that feel, so everything was built around not spending. Start with zero. Nowadays, people start with a budget. Uh, well, I feel, uh, I'm going to make a movie for $50,000. How do you know it's $50,000? Well, it just feels like it's fifty thousand dollars. Well, shut up. It might be one thousand. Don't. It might be one dollar. Don't just commit for the sake of talking out your butt. You don't know until you really know what it needs to cost. So, as film producers, if you want to make those movies, start with nothing and see if you can get people on board with nothing, and then go to platforms that allow you to get your money back. Now, I think we're going to make our money back, and I think with Melissa Gilbert. Maybe in tweeting and, and Laura Ennis and myself, we might be able to get five or ten thousand views. And five or ten thousand views, uh, everybody in the movie is making more than their daily rate. 
at a minimum in the unions. If we sell 100,000, then we're all making a lot of money, and if we were able to sell a million, which some short films can do and have done, um, you know, everybody's gonna, everyone's gonna make out well. You're better off doing that uh, and recording your songs and your music with the quality in which you want to do it. And then the cream always rises, a producer said to me early on in my career, and I really believe in it. If you make a song and people like it, it's going to make the radio. There's not a lot of great songs that are just perfect that aren't, people aren't going, did you hear that? That's amazing. That's a great song. There's usually a chink in it, and maybe if like one of the great ones get heard. They just don't, they're not just sitting there. Great screenplays are getting made. I know people want to think, I got a great screenplay, I wrote a great screenplay, and I showed it to 20 people, and nobody really went crazy for it, but I know it's great. It's probably not great. <laughs> <laughs> write the next screenplay. Right? Just write the next screenplay. There's, there, boom, out, what's the next one? The Beatles wrote 100 songs before Please Please Me made the charts. 100. John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote 100 songs before they wrote Please Please Me. Right? So repetition in anything is important. If you're in the kitchen, repetition is going to make you a good cook, right? Repetition, the ability to improvise. What do you mean we don't have parsley? What do you mean we don't have salt? And still a great meal, right? That's repetition. Yeah? Yes, hi. Hi. Have you um, so far moved on from this project that uh, you wouldn't consider it as maybe um, something that would repeat in some sort of uh, series form, maybe not with these characters, but exploring the same theme over time? I think it's a, it's a theme I would like to explore. I don't know if we really want to step in this river twice, uh -huh. you know? Uh, no. I mean, there's been talk. How can we make a feature out of it? You know, what, you know what, how do we make, what can we add to it to make a feature? If that's that song, let that be another song. You know, um, uh, I think you just continually want to move forward. Uh, I, uh, yeah, this, uh, the style of it, I would love to pitch as a series. Mm -hmm. The style, more than anything, mm -hmm. is to be able to say to the network executives out there that are giving me four million, where are you going? I haven't finished answering your question. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. You, you can go, you can go. Okay, go for me, will ya? Um, uh, the form is what's most important that I want to make sure we, I continue to do. So much freedom, more fun than this than anything I've ever done. Any of the Academy Award movies or the Emmy Award TV or the Tony Award plays, none of them, none of them compare to the ability to go play and then see it come back edited by an artist that was able to do the team sport of it. I'm more proud of this than anything ever. And not because I wrote and directed it, because I share the writing credit with everybody, I share the directing credit. This don't mean anything to us because we're all equal partners, right? So we all own, so it doesn't matter who did what, which is generally the best place to be when you're creating. Don't, I can't remember the ideas that I contributed on so many of the movies and TV shows. Uh, and that's when you know it's good, is when you're throwing stuff out. But the form, the ability to make something for that little that, that has had now you know, as we've done quite well in the, in the festivals just for being moving and, and having an effect with the, with the storytelling. To be able to do that for less than $1,000 uh, in today's world, that I want to be able to do. And if I could put a bunch of actors together and shoot, I could shoot five episodes a week. Mm -hmm. This was one day. I could shoot five a week, shoot a whole season in, in a well, month. Do you work for free five days a week? I mean, I like what you're saying, but... I do think that you're underselling the amount of value that the all the experience that all of you have to get something like this this nuanced and this just well executed done in a day. I mean, working for free is great, but you can't do that. Every well, day. good, yeah, exactly. Well, let me just say it's not the, ideally it's not the the in the form that I think you could pitch. Net, most network TV shows, one hour TV shows, the minimum price tag on that's going to be three million dollars. Um, there were 13 of us needed in this. Now you might could have more people that you would need to pay, but I would say that for myself, uh, the amount, it's not the amount I make per project, it's the amount that I need to cover my nut. 
So I have rent just like everybody else, car payments, my student loans for my kids. Um, uh, you know, I've got bills that I have to do. I want I need to make money, enough money to take care of my nut. Um, the, at the network level, you could give me 300,000, one tenth of what you normally pay, and everybody in it's gonna be just fine, right? Everybody's gonna make plenty of money, especially if I can make two a week, right? So now we're making more money than we would make anywhere else because our overhead is so low that we don't need the, the, we don't need the big budget. So there is a way to make money here, and I would love to absolutely, don't get me wrong, I am a professional, I like to make money doing what I'm doing. Uh, and I think there's a way to do it and make even more money and have even more control and then own the product once it reaches a certain number. If this was a series and we made uh, 70, let's say, at 44 minutes, we fit into a global purchasing uh, market for people that are buying law and orders, which are 44 minutes. Uh, CSIs, which are 44 minutes. Everybody's buying all of those that are 44 minutes long. And if 70 of those uh, from those guys gets 200 million, uh, because, and they might have cost, you know, 100, and they might have cost a lot, you know, that much money, instead so they get 400 million. But if ours only cost 400,000, or 500,000, then there's a lot more money for everybody. So I think. With music, I think the shortcut in music is that record it yourself and put it out yourself and try to get money back from that yourself. Don't go to the studio. Don't go to some record label. Don't go to those people to try to get it made. Make it, package it, and put it out and make the money and keep the money yourself. And don't share it with them. I think that's the future of CBS and NBC. Trapper John was canceled with 24 million people, 30 something was canceled with 20 million people. The networks are hanging on to shows with 3 million, 2 million, 1 million. They're hanging on to shows right now. People are fleeing. It's not working. Network television is dead. Affiliates across the country are being sold left and right. In Lansing, Michigan, all of the affiliates are being sold. The uh, CBS, I mean, they're up, all up, nobody's gonna be going through affiliates because everybody's now going to the internet. ABC.com, CBS.com. Everything we get on TV is going to be through the internet. Cable is going to die, right? Internet will, is the way people are going to see things. So um, everyone's going to have that link. And that link opens us up now to uh, the flea markets of the world with great stuff. I think those are going to, people are going to be able to pick and choose what they want to buy and not feel like they have to stay on CBS all night long. The younger people especially. They're not attached to where they buy it. it used to be in the old days, we'd start with CBS, we're going to end with CBS. You had, yes? Do you think the network will ever have an appetite for anything that's shot and handheld? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of shows that are, that are, that are at, at, at the network level, absolutely. That I just shot. Uh, some, I shoot a lot of this show called uh, uh, The Night Shift, which is an NBC doctor show. Uh, I'm one of the, I've directed about five of those. And a lot of the shows on the network used to be less moon vests at CBS. Did not, when we all, when we went widescreen, he, CBS was the last to go widescreen because he thought people at home would think their TV's broken <laughs> if they went four by three. And so they make you protect the middle of frame four by three to put it on the TV. And I saw a CBS show, I swear to God, where there was a couch and there were two people talking, but you couldn't see the people talking because they were on both ends of the couch and CBS wouldn't air it in a letterbox form. Mm -hmm. They would only air it. So they have now changed. So yeah, yeah, and you know, there's a lot of shows that are handheld and a lot of good shows that are handheld. Anything that makes it feel more immediate and reality TV is totally just as revealed weak writing. Um, and a lot of that's our fault. The writing and the, the acting just wasn't real enough. And you can blame reality TV on whatever. You get mad at reality TV. But the fact is, is that people find it more real than they do a lot of the scripted programming on TV. The problems are real. The people are creating the dialogue themselves. 
and it's captivating a lot of people, even though it's improvised with a structure like we have, uh, it feels more real. Yeah? It's just money. It's the same thing. He went off an outline just like I would have done. Same thing. You have locations. He has more locations because he has a bigger budget. So they take the trucks and they move them. And the union contracts with the uh, uh, studios are such that if the studio is going to make a movie, they have to use IA, which is the technical of the cameras and the all that, the union of a lot of the crew. SAG, you have to have a letter of agreement with Screen Actors Guild. So the minimums are up so high based on the budget. So if they're going to spend $3 million, if that's what they spend for an hour of TV, then you're going to get 10 Teamsters, 8 Grips, 9 of this, 8 of that, and 7 of that. If the budget is 500000 then you're going to get, for the Teamsters, 2 Teamsters, uh, 2 Grips one camera assistant, they'll base it on the money you spend. If you spend less than $50,000, then Screen Actors Guild, Directors Guild of America, IA, you don't have to pay anybody. If you pay less than 50, if your budget is less than 50,000, then they have assumed that you can't make anything any good. And therefore, you don't have to deal with it. They say, no problem, 50,000, what's that? We're only interested in the big budgets. 50,000, 700, I could have made five of these, or I could make a full feature of this. We took cable for granted in our contracts when it came out. We said cable will never work, so you're going to make half. Now, the guy that directs um, uh, Walking Dead said makes $19,000 an episode. $20,000 for that episode. The same guy on, on uh, Rosewood uh, that I've directed on NBC makes 48000 and has 1 million viewer because they didn't, they took it for granted, cable, that it would never build and grow. Now the internet's going to do the same thing and they're taking it for granted. So very much like Larry David, very much like that, exactly. Are you trying to run me out of here? You are. Anything else? Last question? Anybody? Anybody? Going once, twice? Okay, thank you.